So for ceramic materials, it's uh, for me personally, I've, I feel like ceramic materials are always uh, being under, underestimated. When we talk about ceramic materials, what come to your mind? Normally, when we talk about ceramic materials, we will think about pottery, we will think about tiles, we will think about our mug, so we will think about glasses like this. So, um, so a lot of engineers did not appreciate how um, how superior are these all these uh, ceramic materials. So. so um, Ceramic materials has been used for a very long time due to their um, properties, their superior properties that are always being underestimated. So ceramic materials has a very high melting points due to the atomic bonding. Um, they have very good. They very have a very good. High, they have high heat resistance. They have high compressive strength, and they uh, have a good thermal and um, chemical stability in which that if you use it in a corrosive environment, these materials can retain its mechanical behavior. So um, they are very inert to corrosive environment. Um, so that's why ceramic materials in engineering application, it is very, very important materials. Um, so let's begin our class. That's just a brief introduction. So the learning outcome for this um, lecture today, by the end of this lecture, or when you go and do your revision, um, if you can understand all these three learning outcome, if you can achieve all these three learning outcome, um, means that you have uh, mastered this topic, that this lesson. So uh, you should be able to define and classify ceramic material, including the traditional and the engineering ceramic. You should be able to describe the mechanical and thermal properties of ceramic and cite some of their application. And you should be able to describe the processing method of ceramic material. So these are the three learning outcomes today. Okay, so ceramic has been used in civil structure for centuries. So there are many of ancient structure all over the world are made of ceramics. So for example, the Great Wall of China, the Pyramid of Giza, um, the Acropolis in Athens as well. So most of these structural um, materials are made of um, these buildings, the, the ancient structure are made of ceramic materials. So they're made of bricks and clays and stuff like that. So they are all ceramic materials. So as you can see, even for hundreds and hundreds of years, they can still retain their, their mechanical behavior or their properties. So um, even the, these traditional um, ancient materials like bricks, um, cement, um, concrete are still used even until today for building materials. So, and we use building it's the, the concrete in all of the buildings, okay? Because of their superior physical and mechanical behavior. All right, so in the nutshell, ceramic materials are inorganic and non-metallic materials that consist of metallic and non-metallic element bonded together by primarily by ionic bonding and sometimes there's covenant, not sometimes, um, some percentage of the bonding inside the materials are covalent bonding. So they are a mixture of um, ionic and covalent bonding. So basically we define ceramic materials of what they are not, okay? So we define them, they are not metal and they're not, um, they're not uh, organic, they're not, they are inorganic. Inorganic means um, when the materials are derived from biological, uh, biology, so biological sources, um, like petroleum is organic materials because it's from um, biological sources. So, um, so with ceramic, we define them as in they are not metal and they are not 
um, organic materials. And in material science, sometimes we define them as refractory materials, means that they can, um, they can sustain a material that can have sustained high temperature, materials can um, sustain corrosive, corrosive environment and the materials that have, um, that can generally sustain wear and tear. So those are ceramic materials and they can be classified into traditional ceramic or the engineering or structural ceramic. So um, these are the, the structural or the engineering ceramics are the modern type of um, ceramic materials, but they are both still being used until now. Um, even the traditional ceramic, we use them everywhere. Okay, so before we look into the, these two classification, the traditional, what are the application um, and what are the um, applications for the structural ceramic, let's have a look at how the atoms in the ceramic materials being bonded together. So this is just a brief, um, brief revision on ionic bonding. So just like metal, the properties of ceramic are determined by the atoms that's present inside the metal at the ceramic material. So similar to metal as well. When we have um, aluminum, for example, the metal that will be formed will have the uh, different properties if we compare to the metal that's formed by copper atoms. So the same with ceramic as well. So the properties are determined by the types of atoms that presence in the material and the types of bonding between the atoms and how the atoms are packed together. So it's the same with metal as well. So with ceramic materials, the most, most ceramic materials has ionic and covalent bonding exist together. The pro predominant bonding for the ceramic materials is ionic bonding. So revision on the ionic bonding is that um, when we have two elements that donate their electrons and they will have um, they, to achieve octet, they will donate and some, some atoms will receive the, atom, the electron valence. And this will create a uh, an atoms that has positive and negative charge. And this positive and negative charge will be attracted to each other. And this is how they form their bond. So this is an ionic bonding of um, sodium chloride. So which what we have learned from the previous um, second week, I think, second week. Um, we learned ionic bonding in our first week. Okay. So these materials, normally when we have ionic bonding, they have a very, very strong bond between them. Even covalent is very strong, which with the metals, the reason why metal can be shaped easily is because it has C of electron and they can slide along um, each other on top, along or everywhere. They can just slide between each other. However, with ionic bonding, in order for us to actually, um, to actually break the bond, we need to break this, um, this bonding that formed by positive and the negative charge. So that's why what makes materials like ceramic brittle, because um, I will show you why they are brittle. But you have to uh, always remember when the materials is bonded by ceramic and covalent bonding, it is harder, uh, ionic or covalent bonding, it is harder for the bond to be um, to be to be bro broke to be broken, so these are some of the properties of the bonding of the the atoms in ceramic materials. All right, so just like metals, ceram some ceramic also have crystal structure, and some of them doesn't have crystal structure. But we're going to have a look at the one that have a crystal structure as well. And how is the crystal structure um, being, being um, how the atoms are packed together? All right, so since the uh, ionic bonding is non-directional, what does this mean is that if you have a magnet, okay? Um, and if you have, uh, if you have a, a mild steel or something like that, that can 
um, attached to the magnet, you can actually, uh, or if you have a pepper clip, you can actually attach them anywhere around the magnet, right? So this is non-directional. So the, it doesn't have to be at any specific location in the magnet for the uh, for the for the paper clip to get attached to the um, to to the magnet. So they are non-directional, but with covalent bonding, they are directional. So there are certain angles where the atoms can be bonded together. So since ionic bonding are non-directional. Um, the nature will allow a hard sphere packing arrangement of the ion in a variety of crystal structure. So other atoms that's going to attach to the, the um, I think it's the negative, is when the anion, uh, the cation. So a lot of other atoms, the, cat, uh, the, the anion will attach to the anion at any direction. So it can form a very packed atomic crystal structure. So, um, and this packing of the ion is determined by the relative size of the ions and also the electrical neutrality um, of the ions. So this we already covered in the first, um, first week. Um, you look back at the Coulomb's law, um, about the electrical neutrality. So when the material has a, the net charge that is higher, the atoms will um, have a stronger bond. And now we're going to look into the relative size of the ion. So the, when we have an ion and cation, the, the ionic radius of the anion and the cation are a critical parameter that will affect the crystal structure of ceramic materials. So because cation give up the electron, so cation is the positive ions. So they're positive because they give up the ion and now the, um, the, the, the atoms will become ions that have extra extra positive charge from the nucleus. So they become positive ion, so they cat ion. So they give up the electron, means that their size is going to go smaller. And for the anion, it is going to get bigger because they receive an ion, they receive an electron, which is going to make them bigger than the bigger than the cation. So their ratio between the cation radius and the anion radius is always going to be less than unity, less than one. So this radius ratio determines the crystal structure of the ceramics. So when the crystal, when the, um, when the size, the relative size between the um, cation and the anion, are, are too too small like the like the one that you see here. So when we have the size between um, between, so you look at this one first. If we have the the difference between the size of cation and anion, very very huge difference between them, the ceramics will become unstable. If the all the other neighboring atoms touch the cation, they can achieve stability limit. So it depends on what types of atoms that are combined together to form these ceramic materials. So if we have the radius ratio between this value, means that the atoms, the cation will have three neighboring and ion. So this is just a calculation. If you calculate the radius between atom A and atom B, um, the, the radius ratio is between this, means that these materials will have, the cation will have three neighboring atoms, um, the coordination number. Coordination number, we've learned it also in module two. So go back there again if you don't understand. Coordination number is how much atoms 
uh, the neighboring, how many atoms neighboring that one atoms that you look into in any position. So with um, in, um, in module two, we look into um, metals, but this one is because we're looking to ceramic. So there's cation and anion. So here, we have this cation and this is an ion. When the radius between cation and anion is between this range, means that this material has a three coordination number, which is it has three neighboring anion surrounding one cation. If the radius, ra radius ratio is between this range, means that this material will have four, coordination number four, means that the cation here has four neighboring atoms around, surrounding it, and so on. If we have radius ratio between the cation to the anion is between this range, this cation will have six neighboring atoms. So it has one, it has one atom, two atom, three, four, five, and one at the back. So again, if we have this within this um, radius ratio between two atoms, um, cation and the anion, means that the coordination number, the neighboring atoms for the cation, which is here, is eight different atom cation ion surrounding that one cation. So for example, for these materials, um, gall gallium natride, it is um, when you do the calculation of uh, the radius between nitrogens with the gallium, you will get the value is between this value. And the atomic packing will look like this. So everywhere in the crystal structure, in the structure of gallium natride, you will see a repeating unit of this one. So the one, NI, one cation is going to have a neighboring atoms surrounding it of four neighboring atoms. And for example, another example, if we have, this is, sorry. Okay, so if we have, if you go and calculate the radius ratio between sodium and chloride, you will get a value between this and this one, right? So the range is going to be within this range. And we look at this table, means that this cation of this um, ceramic materials is going to have six different, um, six, six and ions surrounding it. So you can see here, you just look at one here, we have one, two, uh, three, four at the bottom, and then we have five, and then there's another one, six here. And so on, if we have, um, for example, the zinc sulfide, oh no, this is, um, this ceramic materials has this crystal structure. So the, um, the radius ratio between the element is within this range. So when you calculate it's within this range, we know that when it's trying to form the crystal structure, the atomic packing, the anion will have the cation will have eight different neighboring anion. So you look at the crystal structure, it will look like this. So you have one in the middle of the cation, and it will have eight neighboring anion. So that's how the the um, atomic packing of, um, of ceramic material being decided. Um, so it is based on the radius ratio between the cation and the anion. And then we also have one major structure of ceramic material, which what we call as silicate structure. So many materials, uh, ceramic material, contain 
silicate structure, which consists of silicon and oxygen atoms um, or ion bonded together in various arrangements. So this is the molecule of silicates. Most of ceramic material will have some sort of, um, will have silicate inside it, like coal, uh, not coal, clay, clay. Tanaliat. Tanaliat has this as the major um, as the major molecules that are bonded together. So it, this is you consider this one molecule will bond with another silica to form the uh, to form the clay. So this is one of the major um, ceramic materials crystal structure. So large number of naturally occurring minerals such as clay, feldspar, micas are silicates. So they have some sort of this, um, this molecule inside their crystal structure. So for example, this is clay. So this is a clay mineral called kaolinite. Ka so you can see that the silicate mo molecules are bonded with other molecules to form the clay. So clay, if you look under the microscope, um, scanning electron microscope, it is two dimension. It's like, um, I can say it's like um, paper sheets. So it's one layer, one layer, one layer. I'll, I'll show it to you in the next few slides. So um, in each of these layer, there'll be a layer of silicates bonded with the other molecule. So this is um, aluminum oxide, I think. Um, so that's how they form clay. So the main molecule here is silicate and also the other one attached with each other. So kaolinite is a clay mineral with a chemical composition as what you can see here. It is an important industrial min mineral and it's, um, it is in a layer structure. So that's uh, why um, you can see if you go and uh, take a subject on ceramic, you will see a lot more of this. But this is just an example where you can find silicate. So another, um, another structure, uh, another ceramic materials or mineral um, that has silicate structure is quartz. So quartz is a crystal um, that is abundant in our earth crust. So this is quartz. Um, I think Swarovski is quartz as well. So quartz can form in different, different color, can have a different color because of some impurity inside the materials. But the original color is going to look like this. So with quartz, it has that silicate structure that you see here, arrange themselves in three dimension. So it will attach with each other, just like what you can see here. So they form a crystalline silicate connecting with um, each other in three dimensions. So this is two dimension, but you can imagine they have all in all direction, the silicates, um, the silicates mineral, uh, the silicates molecule attach with each other and form quartz. But also our glass, this glass here, also consists of silicate molecule but they form in this non-crystalline um, unit cell, uh, not unit cell, they, they form their, um, the atoms bonded, the molecules bonded with each other, not in a crystalline form. So we call them as amorphous structure. So when the silicate atoms, silicate molecules are attached with each other randomly, different microstructure, different mechanical behavior will, um, the material will possess different mechanical behavior. So with quartz, even though they come from the same molecule, which is silicon oxide, they're both silicon oxide, 
But with the crystalline, with the quartz, they attach together in a very um, uniform crystalline form. So they possess a different mechanical behavior with glass. They, they come from the same molecule, which is silicon oxide, but with glass, they did not have the perfect arrangement like quartz. So that's why when you try to break quartz, you need a very higher force to actually, um, higher load and force to actually break them. With this one, with glass, okay, still you need a higher um, force to break them, but it will be much lesser than this one because of the arrangement of the molecule inside it. So that's why we have amorphous ceramic and then we have crystalline ceramic. So the one that I have explained here is all crystalline ceramic. So you will, if you look at the whole volume of the ceramic, they all will have this unit cell. Whereas with the um, amorphous, like the glass, they will not have that perfect arrangement. So the silicate atoms, uh, silicate melt molecules will attach with each other in a random, um, in a random formation. So that will make the mechanical behavior very different. So because of these different atoms, different um, elements attached with each other, um, which um, have a different uh, net charge and all that, all mechan um, ceramic will have different mechanical behavior, just like metal as well. But in general, I can say that most ceramic materials are relatively brittle and hard. This is due to the ionic bonding between them. So if you look at this diagram here, this is how metal, uh, the met metallic bonding. So the, all the atoms here are sharing their, their valence electron, okay? So all the, um, the valence electron will be everywhere here creating a cloud of electron, a sea of electron. So even when they slide, they're, they're because of the, um, the sea of electron, there's no, not going to be any repulsive force. Whereas with the ionic bonding, when they slide, when we're um, trying to shape them, what is going to happen is that is if you have a magnet with the same polarity, what's going to happen? Positive, mid-positive, they're going to repel. So the same with this one. So with the ionic bonding, when the deformations happen, means that the um, atoms at the uh, bonding will start to move, okay? So the valence, uh, the um, charge now, the positive charge will meet the positive charge. So when the positive atoms meet, uh, the cation meets cations, what's going to happen? They're going to repel each other. So that's what happened, that what, what makes ceramic materials brittle and hard. So they're, because, they're brittle because they, they're hard because they have ionic bonding. They're brittle because that the charge, um, when they meet each other, it will repel. So that's what happened um, in the um, atomic um, bonding. That's what happened to the atomic bonding when they meet each other. Okay, so ceramic... That's why ceramic tend to be weak in tension, but they are strong in compression. So these are the general mechanical properties of ceramic. And they have elastic modulus. Um, elastic modulus of ceramic is high if we compare to metal, which means that if we do tensile tests, for example, um, they have that elastic region wider than the uh, metal materials. So the Young's modulus is higher than metal materials, but metal has this region here where it will allow plastic deformation, whereas ceramic, it will break straight away when it reaches to its yield point, 
The yield point normally is the tensile strength as well. So when it reached that, it will not have any sign. You won't see any sign that the, this material is going to fracture. Whereas with metal, you will see a sign. You will see that the metal will starts to get um, stretch and stuff like that. With ceramic, you won't see that. You will suddenly, when the load is too high for it to bear, it will fracture straight away. So those are the general properties of ceramic materials. And then another um, general properties of ceramic materials is that they are very good insulator because of the ionic bonding as well. So there's no free electron, which makes the materials good as insulator. Um, and also as a result of the high bond strength, the uh, ceramic materials has a very high melting temperature, often much higher than metal and polymer. So for um, any heat to overcome this ionic bonding, we need a very, very high temperature for us to dissolve the bonding um, of um, this ionic bonding. So that's why if you have salt, okay, you try pure salt, no water, nothing. Um, try using your pans um, and put it on top of the stove. It won't melt. It will have, a, it will, you will need a much higher temperature for it to melt. So that's why um, salt, you cannot melt them. If it's pure salt, no water, you cannot just melt them. Um, with um, the stove. So if you want to try, you can try that. Okay, so ceramic, as I said, can be classified into two. Um, okay, so before I carry on, you have any questions so far on the structure of ceramic? It's not going to be a long, um, long, but we're going to do some activity after this. No slip plane. Right. Yes, very good. So they say have no slip plane. Um, because as you can see, um, basically we can say there's no slip plane because as you can see here, as I said, with metal, we need all the material, all the atoms in any direction to have, um, to be with the same element. But with, with ceramic, you cannot find that um, slip plane. That, that's why ceramic material is very brittle. So when they try to slip, what's going to happen is they're going to meet another um, so cation is going to meet cation and anion is going to meet anion. So when they have met the same, um, the ion with the same charge, they're going to repulse. So that's uh, the difference between the metal and the ceramic materials. Um, okay, so those are the mechanical properties and some general um physical properties of ceramic materials. So they're good insulator, they're good uh, thermal and also electrical insulator. Okay, so as I have mentioned earlier on, ceramic materials can be classified into two. So we can classify ceramic as traditional ceramic and we have engineering or structural ceramic. So traditional ceramics are made from three basic components, which is clay, silica and feldspar. So these are the three basic component in ceramic, um, traditional ceramic. So for instance, this, um, this mug here has all three, okay? They need each other to form this mug. So the clay here um, is what binds, what makes up the majority of the ceramic body. And um, the most common one is the kaolinite, which has this microstructure. As I have mentioned to you just then, I will show you, this is the all the sheets of the clay mineral. 
So you can see it made, made of that silicate with um, another molecule. I forgot the name. I'll give it to you when I uh, when we finish. Um, or you can give me a second. I will get the name correctly. Okay. So I was right from the beginning. It is silicate and also um, aluminum oxide. Uh, so it is made of a combination of silicate sheets with um, aluminum oxide attached together. So that's why every sheet here is made of, um, of those molecules, large molecules, and they stack within one another. So... So the clay made up the majority of the ceramic body and the others, which is uh, the silica and feldspar, silica act as a filler. So the silica, um, like sand, sand is silica. So silica is to increase the materials, the, the strength and uh, make the clay much stronger. So it acts as a uh, filler to the clay. So all ceramic materials will contain all three of this and they, you need all three of them to create this mug here. Um, so that is ceramic, um, traditional ceramics. So the clay provide plasticity when mixed with water and it hardened this um, clay as you gimain tanah liat dekat luar Saya masih, when I was little, that's what I did. I uh, know your generation didn't do that anymore. Um, so we actually go and play Tanaliat, okay? Um, so clay harden upon drying and firing without losing its shape. Um, and we add silica to increase the rigidity of the, um, of the product. Uh, whereas um, we play, play do yeah. Yes, so Play-Doh is polymer, it is not ceramic, so it's quite different. Um, so uh, with the feldspar is a flux. So feldspar here has a low melting point, which um, used to actually bond the silica, all silica to bond together. So these are the three major um, components inside traditional ceramic. So applications of traditional ceramic, you see it everywhere. So you can see ceramic in um, uh, the glasses I show you. The mug is also ceramic. As for construction materials, the uh, cement is ceramic, traditional ceramic. Um, bricks, uh, bricks are traditional ceramic as well. It is made of clay and all the silica and feldspar contained inside it to, to create the bricks. Um, and also another important application of um, applica important application of uh, traditional ceramic is as electrical porcelain. So and other things is if you go to your um, to your kitchen, you look at your all your mum's uh, plates and um, bowls are all ceramic materials. Um, Sometimes we have polymer as well, but traditionally we will use ceramic as a um, kitchen property. Okay, so these are the electrical porcelain used as um, strain insulator uh, for ta power transmission. So in this application, um, the ceramic is used to support and separate the electrical conductor without allowing uh, current to grow, go through um, themselves. So this material here is made of traditional ceramic because ceramic has a good, um, is a good insulator. So they cannot conduct electricity, they cannot conduct, um, they cannot conduct heat as well. So um, 
those are the application of ceramic, uh, traditional ceramic. I have a video here that I want to show you, which we're going, uh, I'm going to divide you into group and you will discuss the materials that are going to be used um, in this video. So let's watch this video first and then we're going to discuss about it. NASA's next generation spacecraft, Orion, is getting ready to be tested before sending astronauts deeper into space than ever before. It will be launched into Earth's orbit as part of the Exploration Flight Test 1, meant to collect data for future manned missions. Orion will return to Earth after spending around 4 hours and 25 minutes in orbit. Jets will be used to properly position Orion before it enters Earth's atmosphere 75 miles above the surface. Traveling at over 20,000 miles per hour, it gets so hot that plasma forms at 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the air particles around the spacecraft. This may be the most dangerous part of the flight. During testing, crew members on the ground will monitor the status of the spacecraft's return to Earth, but they will temporarily lose the data connection because of the plasma's extremely high temperatures. The onboard jets continue to maintain the proper orientation for re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, while the heat shield, which is the largest of its kind ever constructed, protects the rest of the vehicle. Finally, Orion will deploy parachutes in stages to gradually reduce the speed until it reaches a safe landing. All right, so, so you've watched that video. Now, what I want you to do, um, I will break you into um, five sessions. In that session, I want you to discuss for this heat shield, for the materials to for us to, to protect the uh, space shuttle from the heat re-entry, what are the properties that this material must have in order for it to sustain that much of heat? So that's your task. It's just, you don't have to suggest what materials. You need to just um, to discuss what are the, the properties of the materials that the material must have in order for them to be used to for this um, heat shield. Understand the task? All right. So I'm going to break you into um, four groups, uh, five groups, um, and you're going to discuss this um, within your group. And I want you to put your answer in the Padlet that I'm going to show, share with you in WhatsApp group. Okay, so just like what, what we have done before. Um, let me just share that Padlet with you first. Okay, Padlet is in WhatsApp, and then you your task is you have to discuss among yourself what are the properties of the materials that can be used um, that that the, the heat shield need. Okay, all right. So um, wait, I need to break you first. Okay, so I will give you 10 minutes or is 10 minutes is enough? All right, so 10 minutes is enough. Um, so I will divide you into group now. Um, Okay, so all of you will move into your group and discuss this.
You guys tak masuk dalam group lagi. Just join your group and then uh, discuss in your group. You guys understand what's the task, right? Just discuss what are the mechanic, what are the properties, physical or mechanical properties that the material must have in order for us to form a shield on the uh, space shuttle for for it to be safe during re-entry. And when you finish, um, when you have your answer, um, then you can use the Padlet, just uh, briefly stated what are those uh, materials. Um. So, bincang lah, discuss within you, okay? And then later on, we will discuss all together.
All right, so um, let's have a look at your answer. Um, so I have five groups and all of you give some um, good answer here. Um, all right, wait. Just wait a little bit. So far, group five has answered before, but now you don't have it here. Um, any problem with um, answering the questions? Okay, so let's have a look at your answer. So I have group three. Um, answer is that you must avoid using material that change its property with temperature. Very good. So this means that you need a materials that can retain its properties at a very high temperature. So as you can see in the video just then, that um, when the spacecraft um, entering our atmosphere, it will be they will have a friction between the air and also with the materials of the spacecraft. So that friction is what caused this. Um, high temperature plasma created on the um, spacecraft. So we need to have to use a material that can retain its properties even at a very high temperature. So and then you group three said that you have a highly heat uh, resistance to you must have a highly heat resistant material to avoid it from melting. Very good. Um, must be ductile for any big impact. So I agree with that as well. So as you, you we learn from um, what we have learned before that sometimes we have to com compensate one properties to the other. Uh, you will learn more about this in material engineering, but I want you to have uh, keep in mind that sometimes you can't have all of the properties all together. Um, so I agree you must have a, a ductility, some sort of a ductility as well, um, made up of silica because it's an uh, excellent insulator um, because of its behavior that transport heat slowly over the structure. Very good. So that's, um, that's uh, from group three. And we have group one. So the first thing group one suggests is that it has a high a light materials, which is very true. In order for us to save energy, to save costs, um, and then we need to put fuel in the spacecraft. So that what that's why that has a weight, weight as well. So if we can reduce this, the weight of the materials, the better. So we need a lightweight materials. We need a material with high thermal conductivity that will could could prevent the intense of the heat um, and also high fracture toughness. So materials with um, that can resist fracture, um, high pressure and ductile. And also from group four, same, you have high melting point, which is really true. It needs to be lightweight, yes. And it's it needs to be hard, yes, because there's a friction between the air and the material itself. It must be thermal insulator, um, heat resistant, and non-toxic, not necessarily, but um, it's good as well to have it. When we install that, it can, um, it can, make, uh, it can be safe to the person who installed the material. So that's very good. And I have group uh, two have high heat, um, uh, yes, very good. Non-harmful uh, environment, which means that you, when you process it, when you install that, it cannot, it cannot harm you. And group two has high heat resistance. It can radiate heat, lightweight heat absorption and all that. Okay, so um, yeah, I cannot see group five here, but I saw you have answered the questions you sent. I don't know where is your, um, is your, um, where's your your answer? Where where did it go? Okay, so those are the properties that the materials uh, for heat shield um, that we need for heat shield. So from there, do you think we can use metal for this? That's my question.
So uh, Daniel said no, Atil said no. Um, so Go said no, you say yes. So can you elaborate why you say no and why you say um, yes? So you is the only one who said yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit why you think you can use metal? And if you said you use metal, which metal? Uh, so go say yes as well. So as I have mentioned in the Padlet, it needs to retain 1,260 degrees Celsius at least. So with alloys such as aluminum, it has a very low melting temperature. So if we use aluminum or its alloy, you cannot use that at all. If you have a metal that has, um, that has a temperature, a melting temperature higher than this, um, than 1,260, you probably can. But metal is good, has good conductivity of uh, electrical and thermal conductivity. So if we use metal, chances that we will transfer that heat from the plasma to the spacecraft. So we will avoid using metal because metal has good thermal and electrical conductivity. Yes, like a human oven, all right? So that's why ceramic, traditional ceramic has been used to make this shield. Um, so these are one example of the tiles that is used to coat the ceramic at uh, the spacecraft. So each of NASA space shuttle has a coating of ceramic tiles that protect it from the 2,300 Fahrenheit um, or the 1,260 degrees Celsius. Um, this heat is produced during re-entry into the Earth atmosphere. So this is wrong. This is a traditional ceramic, ceramic, traditional ceramic. So it's um, ceramic materials. Traditional ceramic materials has been used for this for a long time. So the main materials that is used for this to make this style, these tiles is actually sand. So it's a refined sand. So sand that you go to the beach, that's the, the material. They refined it. Um, the, the tile is made of pure silica that comes from a refined sand. So it is suitable because it has a good um it, it it is a good insulator because of the ionic bonding between them so this style has low density so this is the the um, comparison with other materials so if we compare to um, aluminum iron gold even wood um, they have a very good um they, they are very light if we compare to the others and that it has a high melting point because the silica that form the bond between the atoms are in what we call as a giant covalent bond, as what you can see here. They have the similar structure as diamond. So, you know, diamond is sometimes we use diamond as a cutting tool. Not sometimes, a lot of times we use it as a cutting tool because it is very, very hard materials. So only diamond can cut diamond. That's you. I probably you probably have heard that terms before because it's very hard. The atoms of carbon that attach with each other in diamond structure attach themselves in giant covalent bond, as what you can see here. So here is a silicate molecules attach themselves together in a giant covalent bond. So it's very very hard for any uh, at for very, very hard to dismantle this ionic, uh, the covalent bonding. So we need a very, very high energy to actually break the bone. So the uh, ceramic is the best option to have these properties, to have high melting point, materials with high melting point. And the other one, the, um, the, the other properties that this shield must have, it has must have low thermal conductivity. So we know that con um, heat is transferred from 
um, high temperature to low temperature. So if you take an ice, for example, you put it in the on your hand, okay? Our body temperature is actually what makes it melt. It's not that um, the coldness is transferred to our hand. It's actually the heat is transferred from our hand to the ice. So similar, when you cold, you put jumper or a jacket, okay? So a jacket is actually an insulator. It prevents your body heat to to be dissipated into the environment, okay? So the, the ceramic materials, the tiles that is used is acting like a blanket. So it prevents the heat from the plasma to be transferred into the space shuttle. So we need the materials with low thermal conductivity and ceramic is um, the best candidate for this application. So I agree we need a ductile material as well to prevent from catastrophic failure, but sometimes we cannot have all. But if we can have the materials that have all these three properties, we can use them as the space shuttle, the heat transfer, uh, the heat shield for the, um, for the space shuttle. As what Shafi, Shafi said, it's balanced. So we need a balance. We can't have all. We must choose the best of all, okay? So the space shuttle tiles has a very low conductivity, therefore that does not allow the thermal energy to be transferred through it, through it to the space shuttle. So this is because of the ionic bonding and the covalent bonding. So they don't have free electron to help conduct heat or electricity, okay? So those are the applications for traditional ceramic, and now we go to structural ceramic. So structural or engineering ceramic. So the structural ceramic typically consists of compounds such as aluminum oxide, silicon carbide, and silicon nitride. So these are artificial. We don't have them occurring in nature. We make them. So with alumina is made of hydrating the aluminum oxide with bauxite and also for example silicon nitride is made uh, silicon carbide and silicon nitride are made by reacting silicon and carbon and also nitrogen so it the difference between the traditional is uh, the main ingredients are made uh, exist in nature uh, with the structural engineer engineering ceramic we make them so one example is the um the silicon carbide, so silicon carbide has very, very strong, um, a very, very good wear resistance. So this material is very, very hard. So they've been used a lot um, to make cutting tools. So you probably heard about um, silicon carbide drill bits and stuff like that. So they are made of silicon carbide, which is ceramic materials, and also high performance brakes and a bulletproof vest. So this, um, this Porsche brake are made of um, composite of ceramic with silicon carbide. So silicon carbide particles are inside these materials. And other application is um, as a ball bearing. So for example, silicon nitride has an excellent thermal shock resistance and high temperature strength. So they've been used by NASA uh, in their space shuttle um, as a ball bearing. Another example is zirconium oxide. So zirconium oxide also have a very high melting temperature. So they've been used as a crucible to melt alloy. So alloy has high temperature, but because zirconium has a higher temperature, we can use them as the crucible to melt super alloy inside them. Um, so these are some examples of engineering ceramics. So how product of ceramic being made? There are several process on how they can be shaped. It means that how can I make this? Okay. So um, how we make ceramic product? So ceramic processing is 
with this um, majority of the ceramic processing will have this five step. So the raw materials normally come in powder form and it will be, um, it will go through by shaping them. The first thing is that if you look in, um, have you watched how people make vase before, pots, um, using that uh, spinning things? Yes? Okay. So what they did during that time is they shaped them. So that's the forming process, okay? So they use, yes, labu sayong, very good. Um, so that when they spin that, that's a forming process. So the, the materials that they use at first is clay. So the clay will be mixed with water uh, so that we can easily shape them. So that's how it starts with the raw material, which is clay, um, felt spa, if we need to, um, to retain the shape, we put silica. So that's the raw material. We form them by actually we compact all this uh, raw material together and form the shape of the, the mug or the labu sayong. All right. And then the third step is what did they do after that, after they shape it? Who would like to have a, uh, a guess? After they spin it, that's when they shape it. Normally they will put it in the furnace, right? Yes, heating, they baked it. So that baking thing, the baking step is what we call the proper name is sintering. So during this sintering, when they form, the, the powder did not actually um, attach with each other. So if you dry them straight away, it will go back to its original form, which is a powder. So when we bake them, that is when diffusions of atoms starts to happen. So if we have two particles, atoms from this particle to the other particle will start to diffuse. That is when, um, that is what happened during when they baked it. Okay. So that's when the particle actually combine with each other and that's pro that process is sintering process. And then if it ne we need, normally after we um, bake them, the pottery, the potter will still try to make the shape nicely. Um, they cut whatever that's not necessary and that's uh, machining if needed. Um, and then after that, we get the product. So the ceramic processing always involved this process. So um, the, this uh, how the material being processed. So because of this as well, that the ceramic has porous, um, porous structure. So I'll show you um, this step one by one. So there, there is this one example of a ceramic process uh, is powder processing. So there's a lot of processing technique, but we I don't have time to to um, to show you all of them. I'll just use one example here is powder processing. So it starts with the raw material that is in the form of powder. So this is not atoms, okay? So this is powder. So it's an accum um, aggregates of all the molecules combined together and it becomes powder form. And the next step in powder processing is mixing them together. So you have a lot of different powder. You have silica, you have coal, you have feldspar. It needs to be homogenized um, so that you will have properties that are the same all over the product. So we need to mix them. The second step is mixing them. And then this is the process where um, in the example of the uh, pottery is where we compact all the powder, compact them all together. So what they did is that they form the shape so that all the powder are going to be closer to each other. So that's the compaction process. So in this process, all the, atom, uh, all the powder is going to start um, Without the compaction, it's, it, this is after mixing. So this is after mixing, and then 
they start to compact. The more you compact them, the closer all the powder is going to be to each other. But this material, as I said, if you stop here, you won't create the product yet. You have to go to sintering, and if you need to, you need to machine them. So the, during the sintering is where all the powder is going to attach with each other. So um, this is an example of an armor helmet. So this armor helmet are made of ceramic materials. So these are the process where it start. So it start with a powder, ceramic powder, and they mix them together and um, pack them together in the shape of this helmet. Yeah, it does look like dolphin, now you mention it. And after that, they need to go to machining or sintering and sintering. Okay, so they go to sintering and then um, finish where we get the product. So the, here in the powder process, the green machining means that this material hasn't been sintered yet. They need to shape it before, they need to uh, perfect the shape before they go to sintering. Sintering is normally going to be done in the furnace and after that, it's, you get a finished product. But why these materials is, um, is, duct, uh, is brittle? Um, they're good in compression, but they're not good in tensile. Because if you look at the sintering stage, the powder particle after pressing is this stage here, stage number one. And as soon as the temperature increase, the particle is, starts to go into attach with each other and atoms from this particle going to diffuse there and this one's going to diffuse there. So they basically create a larger particle. And as you keep them for a, a long time, this is going to, more particles is going to attach with each other and eventually they're going to bind together. But it is very hard to get a perfect bonding between, a perfect structure between the particle. We will eventually get a structure that has porosity all over. Okay? So when we have porosity, means that if you go back to module 5, the stress is going to be concentrated in this area where we have porosity like this. All right? So what will happen is that um, flex is in the graphite. So it's, uh, it's the same where in graphite is uh, because of the formation of flex has the very sharp corner. Whereas with this one, it has holes. So I can say that it has hole everywhere. So por very porous structure. So stress will be concentrated there. So when we perform tensile threat tests, or if we, um, if we apply tensile load to this material, stress will be concentrated and crack will be propagating in, from this area, from the porosity of the ceramic. Whereas I said that um, they're very good in compression because when we compress this material, it actually is going to close all this porosity. So that's why ceramic has a good compressive strength, but it is very um, weak in tension because of the processing um, of these materials. All right, so this one we've already covered in the revision. So the, the um, solidification of um, ceramic materials and within we uh, with different composition, um, we can also um, we can also plot them in phase diagram. And with different composition, different properties of the material can be obtained. Um, so the way we read the phase diagram of um, ceramic material is the same as the way we read the phase diagram of metal. So you just assume that this is the one uh, like what we assume with pure metal, and this is another pure metal. So, but in this case, we have one type of molecule with another type of molecule. With different composition, we will get different properties 
of materials which we can use in different application. So here, if you look at 100% of silicon oxide, we get quartz. If we have about 55% of silicon oxide with um, aluminum oxide, um, we get another materials with this microstructure. So that's how we read phase diagram of, um, of ceramic materials. So that's about it today. Um, so in summary, we have learned about ceramic materials. It is a non, um, it's in organic materials. So, and it's also non-metal material. So it's one of the non-metal materials that we're going to cover in this topic. So it consists of metallic and non-metallic element bonded together by ionic and or, or covalent bonding. In general, most ceramic materials are typically hard and brittle with low impact resistance and ductility because of their structure. Um, ceramic materials are usually good electrical and uh, thermal insulator due to the absence of conduction electrons. And those many ceramics are used in electrical insulation and refractories. Um, they can be formed by fusion casting or the powder processing. This is um, the old notes here. You can just powder processing. Involve the agglomerations of small particles bind together. All right, so that's about it for ceramic materials. Um, we, we're going to look into polymer materials tomorrow. Um, so we still have about five minutes. If you have questions you want to ask, you can ask me. So what do you think of ceramic materials? So it's now you know that it's not just about the mug. It is not just about the pots and pens, okay? We use them in a lot of application. Um, it's a lot like metal, yes. Um, I, you like metal more? Metal is more versatile because we can shape them in various, um, various using various techniques. We can shape them through plastic deformation, whereas with um, ceramics, almost always is going to be um, casting process. So like the compaction, it's casting as well. Um, like pottery, we need all those um, other different techniques. So we can't just shape them. You, you cannot say, I have a block of brick, okay? I have a block of brick and I want to flatten them a little bit to reduce their thickness. So I'm going to use coal rolling. You can't do that, okay? It's very, um, it's very brittle that if you coal roll them, they will break straight away. So it needs to be um, cast or powder process or compacting, something like that. Try to hold the metal cup and with a hot drink inside. You will feel that it's going to be really hot. The heat's going to be transferred from, that, um, from the water through metal to your hand straight away. It's very, very um, hot because of the free electron in the metals. Whereas with ceramic materials, it's not going to do that. You will still feel the heat, but it's not going to be like metal. But it's different with thermos. So thermos is also metals, right? But what they did with thermos is they actually create, um, they create a vacuum between two layers of metal. That's why thermos, you can um, hold them even though they're metal, it's not going to conduct heat because there's actually a vacuum layer between two metals. Okay, so for exam, what we have, there's not many questions on ceramic or non-metallic materials, but it's going to help you um, get an A. So look into the tiles of the um, look into the tiles of the aerospace shuttles the activity that we did um, it will help you in um, answering some of the questions okay so that's why we have this activity today all right 
Um, if there's no questions, I would like to end the session. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow where we're going to talk about polymer and composite materials. You're welcome. Have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum. Bye, everyone.